Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Buona sera. Um, and welcome to this mag magnificent venue. Um, please try and pay attention. I'm going to have a hard time because it's so beautiful. Um, this church is amazing. Anyway, uh, I will try and stay focused. Um, rather than me reading off their resumes, I'm going to ask everyone to just introduce themselves briefly, um, and then we'll get to the meat of the panel. So, Charlie, would you like to go first? Yeah, th th thanks, Malcolm. Um, my name is uh, Charlie Beckett. I'm a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, I used to be a journalist uh, in the last century, uh, but since 2006, I've been director of POLIS, which is the LSE's international journalism think tank, and um, I'm sort of obsessed by media change, and at the moment, I'm running the LSE's uh, journalism and AI project. We've been running for about four years now, and we're doing loads of stuff again this year as the whole topic explodes. Great. Emily? Hi, I'm Emily Bell. I'm the director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia Journalism School in New York. Um, our center both teaches but also does a lot of research, a bit like Charlie's Center. Um, one of our key themes since 2013, so 10 years, has been the involvement of platform companies in the business of journalism and how uh, their influence has been both beneficial and negative. Um, before that, I was a working journalist for 25 years, um, and most of, most of those 20 years or so was at The Guardian, where I was an um, editor and writer, and ended up spending 10 years running the um, web operations. So I've lived some of this, as well as uh, now theorizing and researching it. Great. Uh, I'm Matthew Ingram. I'm a digital writer at the Columbia Journalism Review, which is also at Columbia in New York, even though Emily and I only see each other here because I'm based uh, in Canada. Uh, Mitra? Hi, everybody. It's lovely to be among you. Um, my name is Mitra Kalita. I um, hold the distinction of running two media enterprises. Um, I run Epicenter NYC, a newsletter based in Queens that was launched in the pandemic to help New Yorkers get through COVID-19. We've since expanded to a podcast for newsletters, um, a lot of civic engagement, and a website. I say the website last. We can talk about that on the panel. Um, and then Epicenter is a part of a network called URL Media. URL stands for Uplift, Respect, and Love. I'm the co-founder and CEO. We have 20 black and brown community media organizations that share content and notably amplify each other's content, um, leveraging their own audiences. Um, and we also share advertising revenue, and we have a B2B um, recruitment arm. Um, before that, I um, spent much of my career in digital media at mainstream news organizations. I can drive traffic like nobody's business, or at least I used to be able to. Um, and my previous um, affiliations were at CNN. I was the senior vice president um, overseeing digital programming. Um, I launched Quartz, uh, Quartz India and Quartz Africa as well, um, and was the managing editor at the LA Times. Those are kind of the digital um, jobs where um, I was most glued to chart beak and chart beat and Google Analytics all day, previously. <laughs> uh, great. So I'm going to, um, I want to sort of split this into two halves, uh, Twitter and Facebook. So I'll start with Twitter. And I want to ask a kind of general question. I'm going to get more personal, though, just so you know. Um, so over the last, I guess, 10, 15 years, maybe, um, I think a lot of journalists, myself included, have come to rely on Twitter to do a number of things, to uh, reach audiences, to distribute our journalism and have others distribute it, to raise awareness of topics, and also to source, to find sources, um, to contact them, and so on. But of course, in, in using this platform, we've also been used by it. Um, so it's been a two-way thing, whether we acknowledge it or not. Um, we've been used for PR purposes, we've been used for revenue, we've been used for data, and so on. And I think all of those things 
and the tension between them have come to a head now that a certain individual owns Twitter and uh, maybe dumpster fire is too strong, I don't know, but it's been a, a bit of a, I like to think of it as a train wreck, except every car in the train is a dumpster and they're all on fire and it's crashing. So uh, I doubt uh, Elon would agree with me with that description, but given all those tensions and given what is happening, I think it, it's incumbent on us as journalists and media organizations to think about our relationship to Twitter. What does it do? What is it good for? Are the things it did before or was good for, are the, is it still good for those things? How are we being used and being taken advantage of and are we um, supporting what, what it's turned into? So I'd like to go one by one. Uh, Charlie, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a big topic. In a way, first of all, I'd say not in defense of Elon Musk at all. Um, I'm not saying he's done anything right since he's taken over, but I wonder if Twitter uh, is more resilient than we might think, if only because, as you say, those journalists who are addicted to it are reluctant to you know, get off um, that addiction. And um, uh, I think it depends who you are. You know, we talk about Twitter as if it's one thing, when of course it is different things according to how you use it, uh, the way you behave and who you follow and uh, the kind of interactions that you have. Uh, and also the functionality, as you say, are you using it uh, you know, to, to listen to other people? Are you using it to promote yourself? Or are you using it just in a more mundane way of trying to gather material and make connections with people? Uh, so when I often hear people saying, oh my God, Twitter is absolutely awful. And I'd imagine that if you're a person of color or a woman doing anything remotely newsy, it probably can be very awful. As a white male academic, it's much more pleasant, partly because I avoid any kind of friction at all. The other thing I think it depends upon is where you are in the world. And I mean, not just with Twitter, but um, generally with social media, that uh, Twitter is, uh, uh, UK journalists are obsessed by it, uh, possibly American journalists to a degree, but many journalists in the rest of the world are perfectly capable of doing their job without it. It's quite remarkable. And that does make you think that uh, if we are less dependent upon it, that probably isn't a bad thing, especially, and I, I wouldn't argue that, um, you know, that you shouldn't go to social media, more, but perhaps you're looking in the wrong part of social media and that you're in the zone where you're talking to other journalists and politicians rather than thinking about all the other uh, platforms and channels and bits of the internet and the web uh, where people are online and saying much more interesting and diverse things. So, uh, as I say, I would caution about um, celebrating or even uh, mourning the demise of Twitter because I think it will be more resilient and if we are thinking again about uh, our relationship with it, that's a really good thing. And you're saying perhaps it's too easy and maybe we'd be better off without it. Is that what you're saying? I don't think we'd be better off without it. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think the more platforms that we have, the better. One of the great problems perhaps 10 years ago was the dominance of, well, certainly in the Western world, of, of Facebook and Twitter. And we saw, I know we're, not, we're talking about Facebook later, but you know, when they changed their algorithm, that wrecked you know, the conversation in, in uh, Twitter. Yeah. yeah, okay, exactly. Emily? So I take a slightly different view to Charlie. Um, I sat in a church very much like this about 10 years ago and said that I thought Twitter was the most important te technical innovation for journalists since the telephone, which I was then relentlessly teased about. But I would kind of stand, I would actually stand by that statement because I think um, whilst Charlie's right, there is a certain sort of obsessiveness. And yes, American journalists are also obsessed with Twitter and obsessed with what each other say on Twitter. Um, but it does something which no other platform does, which it is a way of telling people what is going on in the world right now. And there still is no other platform that actually does that, irrespective of uh, your location, irrespective of your status, 
um, and irrespective, if you like, of your, of your credentials. So, that, so that's a really very significant thing that happened in terms of news publishing. And it brought with it all sorts of problems, like um, spread of disinformation or misinformation. But of all the platforms out there, I would say that Twitter was the one that was taking most seriously journalists and the free press and free press um, alignments. And I, w I wouldn't say they were brilliant at it, but I would say that if you were, it's certainly in the last sort of two or three years before Elon Musk took over, um, they had a set of people, particularly in trust and safety, uh, particularly in their partnership teams, who understood um, what it was to be a journalist doing journalistic work and understood how to escalate uh, crisis and, and, and help protect people. Didn't do a brilliant job all the time, but I, I felt like they were more close to getting it right than anyone else. And that overnight has, has gone. Right. It's, all, it's, those, all those people are gone. Well, all those, so all of those people are gone. And the second thing is, the definition of a dictatorship is when you get up in the morning and you literally do not know what is going to happen because the rules are, don't apply. Uh, they can be changed on the whim of one person. You have no ability to protect your own security or privacy. Sounds familiar. And, 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 this, and this is sort of what's happened. Now, the fact that you have a piece of infrastructure which contains the data of not just journalists, but also civic organizations, governments, um, uh, non-profit organizations, it contains all of the DMs. Now, you could say, well, more fool you for putting your material mm -hmm on a third party platform. But the fact that you could have a situation where all of those entities did, and then suddenly it's not only insecure, but it's dangerous right. to be in that situation. I think we have, to, I think the thing we need to come away from this with is we really need to examine what it means to have pro free press platforms and to have pro democratic, pro journalistic values baked into them. And so when we're going through this next time, I think the field of journalism would needs to, and particularly those with more leverage and profile, really, really, really need to put pressure both on regulators and on the companies to make sure that this kind of thing can't happen again. Because I'm going to say, you know, it really sucks for a lot of people that Elon Musk took over Twitter. It's like somebody coming to your town tearing down the buildings, saying, well, I'm the developer in town now. I don't care that that's where you met your community, and I don't care that that building used to be there. I can do what I like with it. And I d I'm sorry, I think it's completely wrong, I, and I think it's a real indictment of how terrible America has been at understanding the um, information space and regulating it and helping support journalism that we've ended up here. I think it does really reinforce, though, how and perhaps we forgot about it when Twitter was so friendly. Um, you know, it's still a commercial company, and, and Elon has reinforced the fact that when you own it... It's a lot less commercial now than okay. it was a Depen year ago. I mean, Depending he's on your definition he's of commercial. <laughs> he's literally destroyed the value in it but just it's still, on his own personal... It's a company that he owns. And so sure. it's, not, it's not an open society distributed No, he's a dictator. Network. He's a dictator. Right. Right. And I, d I don't think you should have dictators who are able to do what he has done he in terms it, of though. exercising. That's just my personal it. opinion. He bought it. Anyway, I'm, I'm a little leery of using the term dictator because I was just listening to the previous panel in this church, and it was about Jimmy Lai and, and, uh, and real dictators. But, but I take your point. But, um, it ma but, but that matters. I mean, because Elon but, Musk but, can't but put us these, in prison. But Matthew, but, uh, if these yet, anyway. but if these people are not aligned, if, if platform owners are not aligned with free press, then they have the information that can actually Agreed. lead to people being Agreed. jailed. I don't, think it's, I, don't think, I don't think it's a trivial matter. And I don't think that there is a huge difference between the people who put jur journalists in jail and the businessmen who enable those dictators to put people in jail. Good point. I haven't forgotten about you. Do you have any thoughts that, about my sort of introductory, how, so, how attached we've become to the platform? Sure. So I think I might be the only person on this panel who is paying for Twitter, possibly the only one in this room. <laughs> I was going to get to that. Um, if anyone's paying... Yeah. Is anybody paying for Twitter? 
Oh, okay, so me and person. that guy are having a drink afterward. Congratulations uh, for putting your hand up. I admire your... Uh... Um, so I have never uh, relied on Twitter for traffic, and I think that's a really important part of um, news organizations and kind of being clear-eyed about what do we get out of this, right? Um, and I think for the last... 10 years or so, news organizations would get on platforms without that clarity, right? Um, and there's such a disconnect, which I don't want to dwell on, between kind of newsroom managers and those of us who, you know, the company might not be brilliant, but I think we who are on Twitter have been quite brilliant, right? And so I derive a lot of value from the platform. But not traffic. But not traffic. So what do you... So uh, what do I, why did I stay? I think that's, so, you know, I look at the history of this platform and feel like it's an archive of community building. Um, I feel like there are news events, certainly, you know, uh, the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, that would not have only, um, I just would have gone uncovered, let alone um, protested globally on the scale that we saw leading to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I think that there was such a major disruption of creators in challenging mainstream media and our agenda. And so if I, you know, quite frankly, if I refuse to pay for products created or run by white men whose values I don't agree with, I probably wouldn't eat every day. I might not have flown here to Perugia. I might not get into an Uber. And, and, and I, I don't say that um, flippantly because I do think that we are in a moment of transition where my choices and the consumption matter immensely. So I, you know, it's not like I'm disagreeing with Emily here. I worry a little bit as journalists that our coverage of this has dwelled on our verification and our value versus some of the safety um, or the regulation that, um, you know, forget the blue check, but just is somebody getting on Twitter mm -hmm. who they really are, right? And so I feel like we're losing a little bit of that um, basic um, kind of safety and harassment that um, the platform is pretty notorious for. I don't want to overstate my love of how it's run as much as, I, 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 again, just to kind of distill this, I derive value from it, though, every day to set a news agenda. But are you concerned that if there was another Ferguson or Black Lives Matter or Me Too or anything like that, that this platform under this owner would, that those things would be right. the things so, they were or, or that people would experience them in the same way or even know that they were happening. Absolutely. Um, and also the lens through which uh, that would be... Um, so you're seeing this right now, right? The value that I get from Twitter is no longer as serendipitous as it once was. So I do think being clear-eyed, open-eyed about this um, is important, which is why I'm also on a lot of other platforms. Like what? Oh, well, I mean, I'm still on Facebook. I'm on a million Facebook groups, um, Instagram, Instagram, LinkedIn, Signal, um, WhatsApp. Post Are news. you on TikTok? I'm on TikTok. Um, I share an account with my daughter, but I am on TikTok. <laughs> um, Your algorithm must be crazy. Well, it's, uh, it's actually not, <laughs> but if you all want to help on that front. Um, I think for people of color, I mean, it was mentioned um, a kind of where do we go? And, uh, you know, this is something that I would love uh, to hear from other folks of where are we going. I mean, you know, among our um, network partners in URL Media, the irony is where are we going? Like, we're still on the street. We're still talking to each other in church. Community media is very much... Um, a, 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 an IRL experience still. And so I think one other area just to kind of dive into, and maybe this transitions us, but is the gulf between what we're talking about with these platforms and the consumption of not just news, but, you know, information around getting your kids into school and, um, you know, how to get a COVID vaccine and, and that sort of, that gulf um, is of great concern to me and, and partly why I launched the companies that I did. Right. 
So I want to, that sort of leads into one thing I was going to ask on a more, I guess a more personal note. Are you going to stay on Twitter? And are you going to pay? And if you were to advise a news organization or a journalist, would you advise them to stay on Twitter or to leave like NPR and some other media organizations? Charlie. Uh, well, again, I think it's really up to you. I, I don't go around telling journalists necessarily what to do as what? such. You don't? I uh, know. Yeah, um, I love doing that. I listen to what they, 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 they are saying. The key thing, especially picking up on what you were talking about, Mitra, was that it's not about simple choices. One of the facts about it is, is the plurality of potential places that you can network. And that sounds lovely, and it is lovely, but that also means a lot of work. Mm. being in different places, you know. It Even if you're not doing it as a kind of big yeah. traffic commercial thing, it can be a lot of labour. Uh, you know, I'm in a fortunate position that I have other networks. For example, I have a lecture hall where I can talk to people or a mm. seminar room, and I have, uh, the, you know, the Brifani Hotel Bar, you know, where I can network and talk to people, and I get to be on a real wooden platform mm -hmm. to communicate with people. And generally speaking, those experiences are usually more valuable, but they are often supported or amplified by those other online platforms. But they're as well, very restricted know. too, aren't they? I mean, only certain people get invited to the places you no, indeed. you go I'm to. Saying so I'm, I'm saying I'm privileged, but I think other people replicate that in their own ways. Sure they do. I mean, you there's know, private other, WhatsApp other people, groups and... As Mitra says, you also have a family, you have a sure. workplace, you sure. have a sporting association or something. You know, you, you walk around this city, uh, and the Italians are rather good at this, you know, they have a lot of communication. Sure. Um, but you if know, you're a journalist, does Twitter provide more value than it does detract from all the things that you value? Well, I do worry about, you know, I love it and I can see why you use it. I wrote a book back in 2000, whenever it was, eight, about networked journalism, just when Twitter was coming along, um, about the value of trying to think of as many diverse ways that you can listen, news gather, get content, and also interact with your whatever, your peers and your audience. Uh, so I'm, you know, in favor of that. But I think with Twitter in particular, and it's not alone, but I think particularly Twitter, it, there's a real danger of misrepresentation mm. and disproportionality that if you are on it as a journalist all day, you do start to think right. that's the real, that world, the real world and right. this is the real opinions. Right. And you forget it's the people you follow, generally speaking. It's much less serendipitous now. Yeah. Um, and so there is that danger of a news agenda being created amongst your little networked peer group and so on. Now, that is not to deny, I mean, I agree with Emily that it has a you know, vital role, um, along with other networks, in the way that our, whatever you want to call it, our public sphere and our journalism mm. industry works. It's part of the ecosystem. And therefore, I absolutely agree with Emily that just like any other part of our social fabric, we have a right to expect certain standards right. and responsibilities, and we have the right to, uh, you know, democratically um, uh, shape the way it, it, it operates. However, as soon as you get into that zone, very quickly, you do get into a problem. Emily talked quite rightly about, wouldn't it be nice if these networks had the same values as that supported journalism? Unfortunately, Elon Musk would say, well, yeah, I'm, by bringing back all those right. lunatic right-wing accounts who happen to be I'm in journalists, favor of the then truth. I'm in favor of that I'm journalism I'm in favor of the too. truth. Yeah, yeah I'm and, in favor of those yeah. journalists as well as the nice liberal lefty mainstream ones. Emily, should know. journalists be on Twitter or not? Should media organizations <laughs> use it or not? It's like everything else in journalism, I think, is deeply contextual. Um, so you there can only not, pick one. There, well, there is no. There, you can't only pick one. I think that I think that's one of the problems with our profession. Matthew is saying you can only pick Agreed. one. Is like um, so. First of all, I think there are many countries in the world outside Europe and North America where Twitter is absolutely vital infrastructure. Democracy is infrastructure. Don't forget that. Um, it is really vital infrastructure, particularly for um, communities of journalists and how they communicate on. So please see my friend Patricia uh, nodding away in the front. I always look to see if she's going, no, no, that's not true. But no, really, you know, Brazil, the Philippines, etc. It's so important, I think, to um, communities of journalists where there are where there's real pressure on the mainstream 
publishing outlets too. So to say to them, or to say to communities that uh, Mitra serves, get off whichever platform it is, it, it's not as simple as that. I think, I think you, you can't say that. If you're a newsletter, B2B newsletter companies in America at the moment, Twitter is your number one um, platform actually for traffic. It really is. So I thought it was LinkedIn. No, if you're, if you're, um, it, uh, I did a panel with um, uh, Nicholas Johnston of Axios, and he was saying it's our number one traffic driver for for, for a company which is worth five hundred million dollars. So it's not just that by allowing somebody like Elon Musk to do whatever he likes you are saying, well, it's his company, he's bought it. He can destroy value in other com companies and in communities. So I don't think it's simple. I think if you are constantly But to some extent, you're Twitter, enabling him. You're, you're, you're allowing him to do the things he does and use you and your media organization to sure. do those things. And I think that's exactly why NPR has got off it. I think it's exactly why a number of other organizations have said we don't consider it to be, you know, John Micklethwaite from uh, Bloomberg sent out a uh, note on day one, not stopping people from Bloomberg from using it, but just saying we don't consider it to be right. a safe platform for journalism. Which is, so that's the first thing I would say is it is no longer a safe platform for journalists to be on to do vital work. Everybody, I hope, in this room knows you should never DM your sources anyway. Uh, because, <laughs> yeah, exactly, you just shouldn't because those DMs are, as we know, likely to be handed over to Matt Taibbi or Barry Weiss or whoever for them to, you know, we don't know who has mm -hmm. access to those. So, so I think it's a trade-off because there is still nothing, to Mitra's point, there's still really nothing out there that does what Twitter does. And it does create value. So, so I would say we should be really pressuring for changes that, that bring stability and guarantee to where you can't just come in and change everything overnight. There's no reason why we can't have regulation that does that. There's zero reason why you can't make I can people think of a couple of reasons. regulate or, 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 or just or, 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 or give fair warning. You know, it should it should just be the case that that's what that's a that's a minimum standard for ownership of a platform. I'm going to switch gears and jump to Facebook because <clears throat> it is mentioned in the title, and. Uh, the, I think this, a number of these same issues apply to Facebook for a bunch of reasons. Um, but the one I was most interested in is, as you and I have written a number of times, Facebook has provided a lot of funding to journalistic entities. Almost all of that, I think, is gone. Uh, if it's not gone already, it's going. Um, Facebook has gotten rid of almost everyone who was in charge of those funding programs. Um, some of the larger entities, I think, are still getting support, but maybe not cash, I don't know. So I guess I wanted everyone to sort of talk about how, how is that impacting the media? Is it good or bad to get sort of off of kind of Facebook's payroll, if you will? Um, and what do, I know a lot of small and local journalistic outlets, I think, got a significant amount of support from Facebook. Um, so just if you could talk about that a bit, Charlie. <clears throat> Did you break it? <laughs> Do you want to borrow mine? Will that work? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we had fair warning with Facebook, didn't we? Right. You know, the, the change in the algorithms, those people who pivoted <coughs> to Facebook video um, got burnt and, you know, realised. And I don't think the funding, well, for some people, some of that Facebook direct funding was of some significance. And I actually thought much of it was very well directed, such as the money to help uh, boost subscriptions for local news mm -hmm. initiatives was um, probably quite a positive uh, thing in itself. Um, but I think, you know, you know, I know of uh, local uh, organizations in, in the UK who were only based on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's proven disastrous, of course. You know, they really have lost their business. What I would say is that the fact that Facebook doesn't care about news is a little bit of a humbling experience in that I think it should remind us that even when it cared a bit about news, news was a tiny, tiny yeah. part of 3%, Facebook. 3% of Facebook's traffic. And in a funny way, do you know what? 
that may have some kind of parallel with the importance of news in everyone's lives. You know, the, I think we always need to remember that especially our, you know, the kind of traditional news I used to make was in a sense it had a universality, partly because people didn't have a choice, mm. uh, but it also was, I think, quite a narrow uh, agenda and didn't really care much. Now, the news media has got so much better at caring about its audience and trying to be uh, less irrelevant and so on. But I think in that sense, we, it, it is a reminder. Facebook is never had any interest in, uh, well, sorry, Zuckerberg personally and generally as an organization, it never had what Emily it talked about. pretended to. The values so is it better so now that the pretense is gone? Well, in a sense, I think it is. Emily? You know, I, I think we can, again, wean ourselves off any yeah. pretense can, of dependency. Can you give the mic back to Emily? Thanks. Better that the pretense has been removed, or, or are there organizations that are yeah. relying on it and are now going to... Yeah, we, we did a um, piece of research that came out a couple of weeks ago where I think we're the first organisation, because we don't take any platform money very deliberately, which makes the, means that we're much poorer than the Royce Institute. Um, <laughs> sorry, Nick. <laughs> but, but also that we can ask and tackle questions about whether or not these organisations should really be involved in journalism. And actually what we saw from the distribution of funding for Facebook is that um, it did do a lot of good, I think, at local level, and that there were people who sort of, you know, it, they were able to keep operating because of the grants they were getting from Google, Facebook, mm -hmm. and the Knight Foundation, who all instantly moved more or less in lockstep. Right. Um, but those three organizations were really deciding what the strategy for supporting local journalism was going to be. And it's really interesting that actually any efforts, possibly this is a cultural issue, but any efforts to bring in a kind of a news media bargaining code which taxes platforms and gives the money back to journalism went nowhere mm -hmm. in the States. I think one of the reasons is because proportionately much more money from both the Facebook Meta Journalism Project and the Google News Initiative actually ended up in the yeah. States yeah. than it did anywhere else. And that tells you everything you need to know. This is a lobbying organization. This is a lobbying, organ this is a lobbying effort. Now, there are people in both companies who care deeply about news and are focused on supporting news. But at the top of these organizations, this is about stopping regulation particularly stopping regulation from forcing a sort of yeah. taxational bargain to transfer wealth from one part well, of the information system to another. We, and I think, that's, I, th I think in some ways it's good that we've got that out in the open, I think. That whole topic is a whole other panel, the news media bargaining code. Sure. Can Canada is still trying it. Uh, I happen to think it's mm. bad. But I know you and I disagree, but we don't have but, time for that. But I, but, I also th but I also think, to Charlie's point about um, they don't really care about news, it's 3%, etc. I find that really, really, really worrying. How is it that we have things which are gatekeepers and publishing platforms, first and foremost, that don't give a shit about journalism? You know, and don't give a shit about the quality of journalism. Holly, that's, Hollywood doesn't care about journalism either. But, Holly, but Hollywood and is not a distribution. Not a dis Well, I don't know. I mean, it seems as though they make um, they make sort of uh, they make inc an increasing number of journalistic films. No, they don't. But they're an inter entertainment industry. I don't want to. No, interrupt, Facebook is a, Facebook is an is information platform. I got to go to Mitra. Yeah, we're, we're heading into so I, and I'm going to come to the audience next. So get your questions all. I think, again, this is a case of us <clears throat> assigning import. Um, Facebook, sure, maybe it's a lobbying organization now, but it was a platform designed to rank hot women. And so I really worry that, again, we're assigning mission that right. was a part of our desire for referral traffic to an organization that was designed to rank hot women, right? And so just think about, um, or not even hot women, you had to say women whether they- Women in general. Right, yeah. women in yeah. general, they, you know, all of us were subject to this. So I, I, you know, I worry a little bit about um, kind of this 
mission, right? The mission of a platform really matters. Um, just three quick things. Epicenter was the last um, cohort of local news organizations, so I got my fifty thousand um, dollars. Thank you Good. to Facebook for that like parting gift. Um, I will say one, uh, two areas. The last two things I'll just mention. Um, we still see, and Facebook is kind of forcing news organizations for user acquisition. We are paying them, and yeah. we're doing very well with it. But I, I actually don't think we talk about that enough. That basically they built this robust following on our backs and now we got to turn around and pay them <laughs> to keep Classic. users um, you know, on our platforms. That's one other thing. And then the last thing I'll just mention is groups, chats, reels. Um, while we're not getting referral traffic in customizing our content to target, you know, again, um, Emily mentioned local communities. We've actually seen great success, great conversion. Um, as, but again, that labor it takes to customize content for these platforms, we've yeah. been we've been down this road before. Nice, thank you. Uh, question, questions, yes, one in the front. Hi, um, just two brief questions. Um, taking up uh, Mitra's point of the transition and that things are really changing. One is. Um, I'm missing the mention, at least, of a Mastodon as an alternative to Twitter. I don't know, Emily, if you would not consider that, but even more important about Twitter dying, um, I would be interested to hear your take on the, uh, on the idea of Nathan Schneider from a couple of years back in uh, basically buying Twitter as a sort of cooperative and um, really running it whenever, you know, <laughs> the value goes down as it does right now. and uh, there's maybe an opportunity. I'd right. like to put this mm. forward. I mean, Mastodon, I love Mastodon. It's great. But it just doesn't do what Twitter does. I, I, re I really enjoy using it. I enjoy the community on there. But it is um, almost, well, it's heavily skewed to white um, nerds. Nerds, actually. But you have to be one. You have to be one to use the platform as yes. a part of the yeah. problem. It's getting yeah. easier. And I miss, though. And it's I getting easier. And I completely and I, and I think it's deliberately federated for a reason. Yes. But one of the great things about Twitter is that it's centralised as well, and that ability to see in real time mm. things happening in different places and create communities beyond geography, I think is actually. Harder. It's but not the impossible. centralization is also bad. It's, I think Mastodon is great. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite platform, but it doesn't do, and it's, I think it's quite exclusionary for not 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 because it's designed that way, but just because it, that's the way it's mm. gr grown up. And the, as to the Schneider point, I think it's a great point. I think you know if you wanted, to, if you were going to start something like you know the AP today and you were thinking about what do we need as infrastructure to go alongside mm. it. I think you'd come up with something pretty like Twitter and I think having some sort of cooperative it's ownership only, of it. It's only worth about with, 20 billion so. With public interest at, at, the, at the heart of it. I think it would be, I think it'd be, I think it would be a great thing to do but I'm not sure that I can see us getting our acts together to be able to do that effectively. Other questions? Was there one? Yes. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I'm a journalist and editor from the Czech Republic, so coming from, from one of the small markets where we really make uh, great use of uh, Twitter as a source of uh, unique information from leading journalists uh, who are a reference point and media who are a reference point. We would have no other chance to get to, so this is one, uh, I think, aspect that uh, is regularly forgotten uh, in the conversation in the US or Western world, uh, uh, talking about, uh, about Twitter. And uh, it leads me to a question which might sound uh, uh, radical a little bit, but uh, it builds on what Emily was basically uh, saying. I believe that from some time from now, people just will not believe how we failed to ask some essential questions about the role those platforms play in the quality of uh, democracy and the structure and the very fabric of the societies in which we live. Because 
democracy originally, when it was promoted as an idea, it had an economic aspect in it, didn't it? It had this idea that uh, people would uh, spread the ownership of things that belong to the churches and to feudals among the broader people. And I think people, if you just think about Twitter, social platforms as a global public commons, which they are actually, it's obscene for somebody to come and ruin it. And I know I'm, I'm not new saying it, the first saying it, there are academics like Nick Srinček or Evgeny Morozov uh, talking about it. And I think uh, journalists who always say that they are the guardians of democracy terribly failed here defending the, the, the frontier of democracy, which re, really those, those uh, commons are. And shouldn't we be talking more about really Twitter, Facebook, social platforms becoming a public ownership, which they should be according to function they perform? Thank you. Uh, anyone want to take that? Just, just very quickly, I mean, I, I'm not just going to disagree with you, but it's, this is an and rather than a but. Um, I also think, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when we used to worry about news media ownership and the accountability of news media, you know, journalism. And we've sort of forgotten that a bit. So I think when I look around the world, um, I don't see Twitter or, or the potential demise of Twitter as necessarily the biggest problem facing a lot of news media. It's things like political authoritarianism, as well as, of course, the business model crisis. Um, you know, it's this problem of sustainability of our journalism and its kind of relevance. So I, I'm not suggesting that, that, that my colleagues here are doing this, but there is a danger of kind of obsessing about something like Twitter, for example, and Elon Musk's um, mismanagement of it, um, and failing to pay attention about, as you suggested, the failure of journalism, not just the failure of journalism perhaps to, I don't know, stop Elon Musk owning Twitter, um, because a lot of journalists actually love the idea of it. Um, but more generally, the, the, the journalism doesn't take enough interest in its public role, you know. We should, just tend to leave it to the public service broadcasters. Should we nationalize Twitter? Well, we don't, we're not going to nationalize Twitter because, we're, because I mean, I live in America, I'm not yet American, but I mean, to your point, I agree 100% with everything you said. It is never going to happen because it's an American company and journalism in the face of capitalism in America is like a marshmallow in front of a dragon. Um, it just, you know, it is not... Somebody should tweet that. It is, it is not, unfortunately, ever going to be the case that American journalism will, or even particularly wants to, overhaul a free market system and replace it with a social democratic system. That's a very European thing to, to want to do. Um, I think America's in a lot of trouble because it doesn't take its public commons seriously enough and thinks that the market is a solution to them, which it absolutely isn't. But, um, but I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I, just, hope, I just hope that somebody out there is using you know, Mid, Mid Journey or DALI to generate uh, an AI image of a marshmallow and a dragon. <laughs> I, think, I think we're seeing... Um, sort of the silver linings here are that there have to be smaller solutions because of what Emily is saying. So for example, in New York City, 50% of public agency money must now be spent with community media, yeah. right? Now that is an example of we must reach people through means that are hopefully trusted, local, and in their control. You, again, again, these are all... Um, uh, somewhat aspirational, but but in New York, that that system, I think, kind of circumvents a little bit of the um, nationalizing of the discourse, thanks to these platforms. The other thing I'd say is that again, we uh, and I, I I've said this I think three times, and I'm sorry to keep saying it, but we looked at this as referral traffic versus what were we actually doing in these spaces, and so. Um, Epicenter, for example, helped vaccinate 25,000 New Yorkers, right? 
We wrote some stories on that, but really there was a service and information we were providing. The stories that we put on our website and Twitter were much more accountability driven with an audience of politicians and policymakers. Why? Because that's who's on Twitter. I'm not going to make the mistake of thinking that folks who can't navigate, for example, the bureaucratic system of getting vaccinated in January of 2021, um, are like, this is where I'm going to find them. And I, I worry a little bit about newsroom strategy that is serving the platforms versus actually being very- Serving people. Serving the communities yeah. that, they are, that we are supposed to serve. Did we have another question? I thought, yes. Sorry, I apologize to these people over here. I know the sun, everybody is like either putting their arm up or-, or Sunglasses, I apologize actually. for that. Yes. I don't have any control over the sun, unfortunately. <laughs> Nope. Thank you, Matthew. Um, it's Peter Bale. Um, I'm at risk of um, dressing up a statement and, as, as a question, but Emily and probably Charlie, um, the bigger thing this week, apart from the blue ticks, would appear to be the removal of any labelling on Russia Today, uh, CGTN, and so on. Um, I, I used the word dictatorship earlier today in, a, uh, in something I wrote about it. That just seems to be the most extraordinary act of kind of hubris to um, take, these, take these labels away when they were very deftly and, and carefully thought in order to educate and, and help the, the Twitter audience. I, I also got a, 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 saw a blue tick this morning on an extraordinary conspiracy theorist talking about something called the Committee of 300. And I just, I, it's, it's starting to get pretty toxic, so I might join Ben, Sil ben Stiller and go. Not yet, though. Yep. Yeah, that's, uh, do you want to, well, any so, thoughts? Well, it's. Just, it's, va it's vandalism of in infrastructure. That's what it is. It, and that's what dictators do as well. They vandalize your infrastructure. It's kind of, you know, it's not... It's, it, it, and, I mean, Peter's sort of right. And I think that, you know, people say, well, don't overstate this, just move to another platform, et cetera, et cetera. I really do think, you know, don't understate it. Don't understate how important some of these issues but, are. But I don't want to overstate, not to disagree with you, Peter, but... I don't want to overstate the previous verification program, which you said was carefully thought out and applied, which it was not. It was incredibly arbitrary. It, Twitter, no, Twitter had no policies around, like, so journalists, yes, were verified, but then after that, it became just if you knew someone. They didn't have any sort of... Um, yeah, the actual yeah, no, I understand labeling that, content. And I appreciate that. Uh, the, I labeling, just, the labeling content, I think, is an absolute sign of infrastructure vandalism like wanting like wanting to diminish and belittle the work of journalists sure. at the BBC sure. or CBC or sure. you know and saying these are not serious organizations because right. I don't like them right. that's a, a, there's a huge danger in that and I it's think. definitely uh, um, I, I'm not sure of the term but so cat turd 2 for example is verified uh, the Holocaust Memorial account is not verified so the whole purpose of verification is is meaningless um, none of it matters, and that's why I'm glad my blue check is gone. Uh, does anybody else? Yes, at the back. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what Mitra was saying about new strategy not serving the platform and serving the people instead. Um, I think that's spot on, but my question is, when you have young people on platforms like TikTok who are never going to leave that platform and come to your website, how are you going to, what are you going to do about them? So we are on TikTok and, you know, and I'm going to just to really give you, I'm going to be an open book here. Epicenter has a team of six. My guess is most of you are in much bigger newsrooms. So if I can figure out TikTok <laughs> and how you get your booster or your vaccine or how to get your kids into kindergarten or I mean that's the type of stories that we're doing because I know that's where my audiences are now I also have a decent flyer strategy I have QR codes I stand up in church and mosques and talk about what we're doing um, so for organizations like us it's a really multi-pronged strategy that's not um, as much, again, it's exactly what you just said, quoting me, I'll boomerang it back to you, is that we are looking at where can we find our people mm. 
And um, also, how do we continue that dialogue, right? So how do we make it easy for them then to continue to reach out to us that's not, as we also seeded many conversations over the last 10 years, comments on Facebook or, you know, replying to us on platforms. How do we make it easy to find us and actually talk to a human to help you navigate services? And I do know I was talking to someone just last night about this question, these questions, and they said that they actually are, are finding quite a large audience or engaged audience on TikTok for things like climate change and human rights. And so it's not just all kids and dancing and so on. There are people who you can reach in a different way than you might on Twitter, for example. Um, was there another question at the back? Yeah, this is the last one, I'm afraid. So make it good. Thank you very much. Um, the question is, why should we care so much if Twitter or Facebook is dying or not? I'm re representing a, a news uh, organization from Romania that has uh, 300,000 uniques per day without being on Twitter and ve very, very little on uh, Facebook. But we are using Twitter, we are using as journalists uh, Facebook, but without being very active uh, there, because we are believing very much in organic growth. Mm. It's very healthy to believe in organic growth and uh, uh, to, to grow your, your organization like, like that. Um, so I think that th these are tools, very powerful tools, that you should use that. Other tools will come, like ChatGPT or other tools, but they are only tools. So. The question Thanks. is, why should we care so much? Why should we care? I think we should care because, like your organization, like the New York Times, like my organization, The Guardian, there are lots of strong, like Mitra's organization, lots of strong news organizations that can actually do without platforms. But the total of the audience that they address is tiny, and they're a highly educated, news-focused elite. And the vast majority of the population are on one platform or another. And if they never encounter news uh, that's of high quality and useful, and all they're encountering is what we see filling the void, which is public, everything from public relations at the benign end through to pretty toxic propaganda and other and sort of you know, hate speech, etc. Then, then I, so that's why I think we really care about it. It's not necessarily just the health of our industry, but the health of democracy where these platforms, for good or ill, play such a big part. And I'm afraid we're out of time, but uh, I'm sure we'll all be standing around outside if you have any thoughts you want to share. Um, and thanks very much for coming. Please thank the panel. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks very much. Thanks.